It's an exciting moment for me because I'm going to introduce Mr. Rolf Payette. So come on in, Rolf. This is this is my great Funny. friend, Rolf Payette. We've worked together for many years in Seychellois waters and then much latterly on more global ocean issues. And Rolf is now here in Geneva, Switzerland, but we know his heart is in the Seychelles, same as mine. And But for Rolf's leadership, and this is no exaggeration, the apologies for saying this, Rolf, but, but for Rolf's leadership in the UN, we would all be living in a giant, out-of-control global chemistry experiment. Because this man you're looking at here, Rolf, he's in charge of the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions. And that is the thing that keeps us all safe from persistent organic, pol organic pollutants and all of the knock-on effects of it. So I don't say this lightly, this, it gives me extreme pressure, pleasure to introduce Rolf Payet. I haven't seen Rolf for a week because a week ago, this man was the best man at my wedding. So there you go, Rolf, come in. <laughs> thank you so much, Paul, and thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, before I just start, I just want to point, it, to point out to this uh, painting behind me. It's actually an original painting, so don't come and pinch it. But it's made by uh, a very late friend of mine who I miss very well. His name is Alan Enesta, and he's from Seychelles. And he had a passion for painting anything about the oceans. And today I just wanted to devote this presentation to him and, uh, you know, his legacy and his passion for the oceans. And, and this hangs in my, in my office and reminds me every morning how important it is, especially when you are in Geneva, you know, in the middle of the beautiful mountains and the lakes to, re to remind us that the oceans are so vital for us, uh, for our life on Earth, but also for our survival and enjoyment on this planet. So I will now move to my presentation, if it's OK with you, Paul. Yes, please. Thank Excellent. you very much. Can you see the presentation or is that visible? It's on my second screen. How do I get this? Now, that's a, that's a good question, Rolf. Yeah. I can't see it. I can see you and the beautiful painting. I think you need exactly. to share the screen. Here you go. Oh, there it is. Perfect. The guys are... <laughs> okay, so pollution is one of the key drivers of biodiversity loss. Biodiversity loss. And, and I realized that very young, as growing up and, and really enjoying biodiversity, but seeing the impacts of pollution, of human activities that we have on biodiversity. So sometimes when we are, we are focused on preserving, studying ecosystems and, and trying to save nature, we forget that we are the primary driver for biodiversity loss. And, and we've seen uh, destruction of forests uh, uh, and biodiversity and, uh, and uh, of course, the impacts of invasive species. We've seen uh, land being cleared for development, for our culture, all this because of human activities. And I think it's important that we do, uh, we do focus on, on the importance of, uh, of uh, the human activity in terms of biodiversity conservation. And here I will focus this morning on chemicals and wastes, and they are everywhere in our lives every day. We use them in the home, we use them in the, in the workplace, we use them in transport, in travel, in leisure and hobbies. They are basically everywhere. And once we are finished with those products, we just throw them away without thinking of the consequences of those products. As you all know, um, the, we, we're currently now implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. And the specific uh, development goal for, for chemicals and waste is responsible consumer consumption and production. This is looking at how we as humans uh, consume the products we buy and purchase in the shops every day, and of course, how we um, dispose of them. Uh, many of you who are parents uh, tell our kids every day, do not waste, do not throw away, do not, uh, do not uh, you know, uh, get something that you don't really want. And we even as adults do the same thing. We, we, we know that food waste is very high in some areas of the world when some other areas of the world are dying of hunger and poverty how much attention we give to the amount of waste we accumulate and we just put in the in the bin and forget about it. And we think that it is going somewhere uh, useful. Actually, it is ending up in the oceans. It is ending up in our rivers and contaminating the soils. I just wanted to bring your attention to the impact of mercury. Mercury is currently uh, managed under the International Convention on Mercury called the Minimata Convention. It's a very new convention. But mercury is a very deadly 
metal and a very de deadly pollutant, which is uh, which is coming from emissions, for example, from coal power stations and from from uh, other power stations. And of course, it's very much linked to climate change and to link to our health on this planet. And mercury is transported around the globe through emissions, as you can see in this photo. And uh, although it might not be next door to us and maybe a thousand miles away, but it will eventually come into your airspace and come into your homes and eventually breathe in uh, traces of mercury, which in fact will accumulate in your body. We also have persistent organic pollutants, as mentioned by Paul. These pollutants travel long distances, and in fact, they've been found in polar bears. And, and I rely on people like Paul, who leads all these wonderful expeditions around the world, to collect those samples and bring it to the laboratory so that we can measure. And uh, recent studies have found that even in the deepest Pacific Ocean trenches, seven to 10,000 meters below sea level, we have uh, detected the presence of those very uh, toxic chemicals. And of course, these uh, pops have effects on a range of ecosystems, including migratory species like birds, whales, and as mentioned before, polar bears, but also in, in forests and, and other animals. There's also accumulated uh, pops, as you can see, here uh, in, in seabirds, which affects their, their reproduction, which affects the, the, the migratory patterns. So all this is happening behind the scenes. And like, I, like the title of my presentation says, making the invisible visible. We don't see it every day. And, and much of the information as well, we are still researching and finding, and finding out more and more every day. But this is happening behind the scenes. And the, res the, 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 the main, uh, the many um, sources of this is us as humans. We are the ones responsible for this and we have to do something about it. There's also the, the tons and tons of pesticides and biodiversity that, and, 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 uh, and uh, fertilizers that are used to produce our food. And that's why it brings me back to food waste. If we just imagine how much pesticides and fertilizers were used to produce the very food that we find in our supermarkets every day. Now, these are, these are products that we take for granted, but it comes at a heavy cost to the environment. And pesticides, they don't degrade naturally in environment. Some of them can persist for many, many years, as long as 50 years, and they can, tra and they can traverse long distances and accumulate in, in, in animals. So uh, pesticides is a very important a biodiversity issue when you think about it. We also have pesticide poisoning, for example, uh, there's research in the in the Indian condor, in the bald eagle populations in North America, which declined actually because of exposure to a very toxic chemical called DDT. Now you might think DDT, but that's 50 years ago. What I'm trying to tell you today is DDT is still present on our planet today. And our efforts to try and eliminate it has been very difficult. Yes, uh, there's all, most of the factories have closed down. There's actually one factory in the world that is still producing DDT because some countries claim that they need DDT to control malaria. What are we doing about it? What can we do about it? DDT should be eliminated from our planet. And in fact, the parties to the Stockholm Convention set up a deadline for the elimination of DDT, which is 2026. But I doubt whether we will be able to, to eliminate DDT and we need the support, we need the, the, the engagement of everybody for us to phase out this chemical once and for all from our planet. Very important. This week we celebrated the International Day of Bees. And, and there is this famous saying, you remove all insects from the planet and the planet dies. And you remove all human beings from the planet and the planet will, tr uh, will thrive. The reason for this is insects, although our kids might not like it, although our wives and and colleagues might not like it, play a very, very, very important role in maintaining our planet, in, a, in, a, in a doing fertilization of plants so that we can get fruits and flowers and vegetables, but also in degrading and, and picking up, uh, not bees, but other kinds of insects and organ in small organisms in cleaning up our planet. They, they play a very, very important role. And, and they are in the front line in terms of impacts on pesticides, on chemicals. In fact, the bees are very, very sensitive to pesticides and chemicals. 
and and you can see that overuse of pesticides will in fact have a big impact on populations of bees. Currently, there are 16.5% of vertebrate pollinators and are threatened with global extinction. Yes, we might think of bees, but we also birds play a very important role. Small birds, large birds, they all, and, and even like uh, if you go to Seychelles, you find that uh, even some of the lizards play a very important role in, in, in pollination and keeping our planet beautiful, but also productive in terms of food. Sadly, this is the situation today. And this is a situation in every country of the world, whether you're from a small island state or from a large country, the problem of waste has become the global challenge for us today. It is not that we don't have any solutions. It is that we don't have enough political will for us to address the problem of waste. We don't have enough consumer will. We don't have enough industrial will, and we don't have enough global individual will for us to tackle the issue of solid waste. Now, we have the solutions, we have the technology, we have the resources, but we just need the commitment, the will of everybody for us to deal with this. And as you can see, 2.1 billion tons of waste per year is not managed in an environmentally sound manner. What I mean by this, is that means those wastes are thrown in the environment. They are put in rivers, they are put in channels, they are put on land, they are put in forests, they are stuck in the mangrove swamps, and of course they are stuck on corals, they are in the deep ocean, and of course, as you probably heard, of the large marine plastic patch in the Pacific Ocean. It's not only in the Pacific Ocean, but we have plastics, tons and million tons of them roaming the oceans, whether it's the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and even in the Arctic. So, so, so the situation is not looking good, guys. We need all of us individually to make an effort to uh, really contribute towards management of waste on our planet. Electronic waste, and this is something that uh, we all accustomed to now. I mean, especially during COVID-19, we've been uh, you know, mopping up and buying up uh, new printers, computers to work from home, improving our mobile phones. But the key issue is what do we do with those equipment when, uh, when they end the, 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 at the end of their life? Do we send them to a proper recycling center or we just put it in, a, in, a, in, in the bin or we just throw it away? Or it ends up, as shown in this picture, in Africa where there are poor um uh, recycling facilities and where these people actually burn off the the circuit boards to extract gold and other precious metals and as a consequence uh with the burning emit toxic chemicals into the environment not only for them but as i mentioned before those toxic chemicals travels for thousands of miles ending up into our own airspace and this is a very very sad photo as you can see i'm sure you've seen those photos before they are the impacts of plastics on the marine environment, not only on the sea otters, but on at least 800 marine and coastal species are affected by uh, plastics in the oceans, whether it is from fisheries or from land as well. We also have seen many, many pictures and of course documentaries on how these plastics break down into very small pieces. And these very small pieces now have been found in fish. They've been found in meat, they've been found in plants, and recent studies have shown that these very small pieces of plastics are also floating in our atmosphere. So essentially, we are eating little pieces of plastic and also breathing small pieces of plastics. Guys, this is serious. We need to reverse this, and we can reverse it. This is not something that is impossible to reverse. It is not something that is you require uh, high technology or high uh, intensity research to, to reverse it. It takes commitment for us all together as one nation, as one people, not as one nation, as one people of the planet to each one of us contribute towards reversing this trend. I will stop here and just say that global security isn't a threat due to the threats posed by pesticides. There needs to be a reduction in nature's exposures to pesticides. We need to adopt better and integrated approaches to agriculture. 
we need to promote the environmentally sound management of chemicals and waste. So climate change, as I mentioned before, is a key factor. We're all talking about it today, but it is its, its source is pollution from human activities, pollution from cars, pollution from industry, pollution from consumption. So this is just a quick two slides on what I'm, the three conventions that I'm responsible for. The Basel Convention deals with waste. It specifically deals with transboundary movement of waste, which means it asks all countries to deal with their waste instead of shipping it across the world to somewhere where the waste is not being dealt with and where it is being dumped. And this has been happening and we've seen much evidence of this waste coming from one country and being dumped in another country. The Rotterdam Convention deals with the issue of pesticides. It calls on countries to record, uh, monitor, manage, and, and, and oversee the management of pesticides and their use in agriculture. Training of, of, of pesticide operators. Yes, we're, we're probably gonna need pesticides because of the impact of of pests in our food production. But we see that there is abuse, there is overuse, there is uh, a lot of other issues related to the use of pesticides. And finally, the Stockholm Convention, which I mentioned before, deals with persistent organic pollutants. And these are some of the worst chemicals that has been invented and currently has an impact on our health and also on the environment. And we need to get rid of those chemicals. So with those few words, I thank you. And I have the pleasure also to launch our new report that is fresh from the printers. In fact, it's uh, it's uh, it's one of few days old and you can go and see it on our website here. It's looking at the internal changes between chemicals and waste, multi-environmental agreements and biodiversity. And in fact, it just opens up everything that I've said today and puts it in a very concrete way that policymakers can use it in decision-making. So with those few words, Paul, over to you. Thank you so much. That was a great sort of call to action, I would call it, Rolf. I mean, for you to put that all together in 20 minutes, I think was absolutely fantastic. And for me, I mean, we're full of questions here, as you can well imagine. But for me, I remember you showing me that graph, and, it, and, it, and I'm thinking about plastics, and it went from 1951 to today as to how much plastic we have produced and how much has been recycled. And if I've got it right, only about 9% of the world's production of plastic has ever been recycled. Is that right? Exactly. Very, very much correct. Yes. And, and, and I was born in 1951. Ah. So I look at that and it really hurts. I see that and go, ah, you know, th this is painful. So only 9%. Of course, the rest of it, it's either been, am I right, Rolf, in saying that, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's all it, over the place. I mean, yeah. if we were to pile it all together, probably it will be as big as our planet. But because it's spread all over, we think, ah, oh, the problem is, you know, it's not as big as it is. But if we start putting it all together, I think everybody would be scared out of their wits because it's such a huge amount of plastic that we have been producing and throwing it away without concern of uh, the impact on the environment, but the impact on us and our children, because our kids will inherit this problem of cleaning up the planet. And this is not fair. I like it. You said, um, you know, it scare us to death because I it, it, not only the numbers, but you must remember, and you were probably part of it, when it became in everybody's consciousness that nanoplastics were in the food chain and yes. therefore in us. Um, exactly. There was an amazing study. It feels old now. It might, may have been five years ago when we discovered that uh, nanoplastics cross the blood brain barrier in fish yes. and then that led to us understanding that nanoplastics in us and I still remember those studies and they were done uh, in Europe I can't remember which country and it sh and it was basically based on young children yes and it showed that nanoplastics was in them and exactly. each time we get that message I think well we may be lazy humans may be lazy and we only we only change when we have to but this is so significant that we must change and I think that really did help. I think it was a big wake up call for everybody. And I've got a question here, Rolf. What do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has done to the way we look at um, the way we manage waste? I think it has done two things. First, I think it's a wake up call that the environment is important, that life is important, that we need to value this. 
On the other hand, in the medical field, we are fighting a, a disease, so we're forgetting about the waste. So what we've seen now on the beaches, in the parks, everywhere, even my son, I have to run after him every day, pick up your mask, keep your mask, put it in a proper place for disposal, you know? We need this kind of education. It boils down to the root cause of what we have today is this kind of education and awareness that we as humans are creating the problem. And once we understand this, then we can take action to avoid uh, or to reduce the problem. Yes, we need the mask to protect ourselves from health, but we need to dispose of those masks in a proper place. We need to, dis to dispose of these syringes. And now we, we have this global vaccination. I'm scared at the amount of syringes and needles that we will find washing up the beaches of the world. I'm sure we, we have already photographers and photos and probably will come in the global biofest of people showing in very remote areas, syringes, needles, masks and gloves and other health equipment, which is now being used to fight COVID and, and spreading around the world. I'm very, very much concerned that we are not focusing also on this impact of those kinds of medical waste. It's almost, as you say, it's almost the unforgotten effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, for me, um, I'm with you in Geneva, Switzerland. And I, when, I, when I cycled yesterday, I came across a number of masks on the side of exactly. the road. And exactly. it's, as you know, it's a very clean country here where exactly. everybody here is very well. But it was the first time and it just hit me to go, ah, someone's mask was probably maybe blown out of a pocket or blown out of a bag or you know, blown out of a window of a car or something, but there's no responsibility to pick it up. And I find that completely amazing. Well, well the thing is, it's also psychological, Paul. You won't pick up somebody else's mask because you think it's infected. You think it's that. So it's going to be stuck in the environment. I will pick a can of Coke that somebody dropped. Uh, I do that when I go on hikes and everything. I pick up the plastic bag and I... But mask, I'm thinking twice. Ah, this is, uh, you know... So, so, so... That's why I said the situation is, is, is we are worse off in that way. And where do we have the big global incentives, Rolf? I mean, I was with you, alongside you, when you led us uh, two years ago in um, Geneva at the Triple Cops, when the, the, the great announcements and progresses were made on plastic and, and the uh, prior informed consent needed for shipping. And that, that really changed the shape of um, plastics and waste uh, shipments. I mean, it really did. And and, and uh, for those of you watching who don't know the detail, you must have seen on the headline news is where some of those containers of waste were sent back to their home countries. Embarrassingly, some went back to England. I know some went back to Canada. And these were, this is great. So it meant that we, this brought an end, at least legally, to this um, waste dumping on countries. Yes. Um, yes. So we've got the law, but what else can we do, Rolf, about this? Yes, well, what was amazing at this conference is all the countries, 180 plus countries decided and said enough is enough. We have to do something about waste. We have to do something about plastics. And for me, that was the one of the biggest and, and feeling of achievement after working you know, uh, in the Secretariat for the last six years and working with those countries and trying to bring this issue forward. So for me, the next step is the, the structures at the national level. Countries have to put in the right laws, have to build the capacity at the national level. As I has mentioned in the introduction of my presentation, the technology, we have it. The resources, we have it. We just need to be able to deploy them and support those countries to be able to manage their waste. In, in a serious manner. Often this is the last on the agenda. As you know, many countries are dealing with uh, COVID crisis. They are dealing with the economy. They are dealing with creating jobs. All this is fantastic. It's great, but we cannot forget waste. It is not something that we just put away thinking that it will go away. It will not go away. It is creating both a national problem and also a global problem that will affect uh, health in the long term. Well, thank you, Rolf. And I, and I feel that this is maybe a sweet spot for us all because certainly I've been celebrating since COVID arrived with some of the headlines I see along the lines of this arrived because of our outer balance relationship with nature. Um, we must rebalance it. We must protect what we have, restore what's been damaged and reset our values so it doesn't happen again, of course. So we celebrate the fact that that is in such public awareness. And since then, I think I have seen more awareness of global 
environmental issues than ever before. Um, there's a lot of big commitments out there. But as you well know, Rolf, and you, you're part of this great leadership, we need now, we've got enough information. We need to turn that information into smart political action. I mean, when exactly. people ask me, I always say, remember, as an individual, you're powerful and influential. Everything you yes. buy and yes. everything you vote for can influence global exactly. issues. So in the last couple of minutes, Rolf, what, what would you say to people who say, and I've got ta stacks of questions here, what can we do in our daily lives to make a difference in regards to persistent organic pollutants and the waste issue? Start by doing something in the home. Start looking at your waste. Look at it every day. Look at it every week. Say, I'm going to reduce it by 50%. I'm going to, I'm going to start reusing containers. If you come to my home port, you will see all my jams and everything are ah, in reused containers. I refuse to buy new containers anymore. I buy the frozen fruits and I make my jam and I put it in a reused container. Or buy, buy in, in, in bigger bulks so you re, re, reduce the amount of packaging. Many shops now in Europe, and certainly when I was growing up in Seychelles, you used to buy what we call in from a big bag. So you came with your spatula, you put in a big bag, uh, you know, and, and then you go and wear it. So you brought your bags to the shop, you put in your beans or your lentils or your rice or your potatoes in your home bag, you wear it, and then you, you pay for it. So this is the, we're going back to what we were before. And this is the kind of thing that we can push supermarkets, we can push our, our distributors to start doing so that we can effectively reduce the amount of waste that we're producing. And this is something concrete that we can start doing now, today, in the homes. Well, Rolf, well, thanks very much. Well, that's exactly what I want to hear. We all want, to, you all want to feel want part of the solution. And for those of you who just heard Rolf say about the, the great success that was made in Geneva a couple of years ago, just a moment to, to, to let me put that in perspective. I was there working there for two weeks to report on, on, on the progress of um, uh, the BRS conventions. And the every single detail from these 187 countries, every single word has to be agreed by everybody. And it's amazing to be in the back of this beautiful UN hall that you've all seen on television and see the screen up there and everybody's debating about the certain words in which, you know, the grammar and the exact intonation of this message. And Rolf is the man that pulls all that together into yes. messages that we can all understand at our home. Yes, because it's, inter it's, it's international law and it's binding. Really and once the country is signed, they are bound by it. And, and this is international law being created. And that's the, the fun part of it. I, I miss running after my birds, counting the fish, monitoring the corals. But, uh, you know, being here at the world stage and bringing the countries together to really make this progress is is something unique and something very important if we have to if we need to have this impact on the ground if you get what i mean it's great i certainly do rolf so we all appreciate you here at the global leader level of course and leading us but the passion and the energy comes by the fact that you feel it on the ground you exactly feel the forests and the rivers and the oceans and that's the passion exactly. that we all benefit from love it rolf exactly. thank you so much that, we'll be together i don't know in seychelles wild yes, waters or up a yes. Swiss mountain fairly soon. <laughs> Very soon. Have a great global biofest and great well, to be part of it. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much, sir. We'll see you later.